What is Gantt chart in project management? A Gantt chart shows duration of project tasks as bars mapped on a timeline. It shows dependencies between tasks, a sequence of work and planned start and end days for each task. And it's one of the most popular and powerful tools in project management. That's why in this video I'm going to show you how to create and use Gantt chart on your project. And stay until the end because I'm going to share some practical tips and tricks from my experience as well. So how do you create a Gantt chart? So first of all, for sure, you need a tool to make it seamless and effortless. You don't want to create a Gantt chart in Excel or draw it in any drawing tool. Luckily for us, almost all project management solutions have Gantt charts included. But here's the biggest problem that I see. If you take any of these project management software applications, you will notice that Gantt chart is in the center of the application. It makes you start working from the gun chart, but it's wrong. Gun chart is a visualization of your tasks, durations and estimates. So before you can draw out a gun chart, you need to do all the prior work. So let me explain you how to do it correctly. So ideally you start with a work breakdown structure. You just take your deliverables, work packages and if you have activities and transfer them into Gantt chart. And that's why most of the software applications for project managers do this in a seamless way. On the left hand side, you have your work breakdown structure. On the right hand side, you have a Gantt chart at once. I'm totally okay if you don't use a work breakdown structure on your project, you can for sure simply list out all the tasks and then create a Gantt chart from them. But the biggest benefit is that you can group related activities under deliverables or work packages and Gantt chart will show it as well. The next step is to assign resources to each task and you have several options here. If you already have a team, for sure you will assign real people to each task based on their expertise. If you don't have a team, you need to identify a role on your project that is capable of completing this task. For example, a senior software developer or a senior QA engineer and so on. At some point you will hire a real person and then you will substitute this role with this actual person on your gun chart. Likewise, you need to think about materials, tools and equipment for each and every task. For example, you have some unique tool or machinery on your project and you have only one piece of it and several tasks will require this machinery. So that will be the key constraint for your project. Okay, what do we have right now? We have a task with the description of what needs to be done and we assign the person and tools and materials to this task. So next we need to estimate how long it will take for this very person to do this very task. And in addition to that, you will also estimate the costs and the amount of materials and equipment that they need. And as you understand, only now your tasks will get length of bars on the timeline because that's their duration. Now you need to identify the dependencies between each of these tasks. And for majority of small and medium projects, I recommend that you stick only to two types of dependencies, hard dependencies and discretionary dependencies. So hard dependencies is something that is dictated by the technological process and you can't change it or something that is hardly required by your clients and customers. In general, it means that you can't start the second task without the results of the first task. After that, for all other tasks, you need to assign discretionary dependencies based on your vision of the project's workflow. And that's where a lot of project managers don't understand it. You want to have a strict sequence of tasks all the time, just to give the shape to the project, just to make sure it's structured. Now it's time for the first sanity check. So you created a long sequence of tasks with all the dependencies and durations. So if you have a strict deadline for the project end, you need to check whether you meet it or not. And here's the biggest tip I can give you in regards to the project schedule. If your clients and customers don't have a strict deadline and they are okay to keep this long sequence of tasks which go one after another, then you should stick to it. Why? 
because this type of schedule has the least amount of risks and communication overhead. But in real world, clients and customers don't want to wait long. They want to get their results of the project as soon as possible. That's why you need to break your schedule down and put the parallel threads of work one under another. That's why you start applying compression techniques to your schedule. And in most cases, you will just take your long sequence and break it down into several parallel threads of activities. If that doesn't help, you start applying additional resources to each separate task to make the duration short. And as you understand with the law of diminishing returns, at some point, adding more resources will not shrink your schedule further. And here's what you need to understand. When you apply these compression techniques to your schedule, you introduce a lot of risks because you need to manage several threads of work at once, they depend on each other, and resources need to be leveled across the whole project. That's why you as a project manager need to balance out the risks of this compressed schedule with the most efficient variant of it. You need to end up with not the shortest and the fastest schedule for this project, but the most realistic one based on all the factors that you included into the schedule. Now another problem appears. When you have parallel sequences of activities, you need to ensure that you don't overload one of the resources. And as you understand with this approach, you may assign 16 hours of work to one resource and for sure this person won't be happy about it. That's why you need to go through the whole sequence and see if you don't put lots of tasks at one day to one person. The good thing is that a lot of project management software applications do this analysis of resource leveling for you and they actually show you how many hours you have allocated for each person per given date. So the main goal of this resource leveling technique is to ensure that each resource, each person of your project has 100% workload for each day. But you should be very careful here because in the real world a person doesn't put 100% of their time into the task. They have other distractions like meetings, clarifications, communications and so on. And that's the whole another topic. I'll leave you a link in the description about how to do the estimates to avoid all these problems. Okay, now we're switching to tips and tricks from practical experience to ensure that your Gantt chart actually helps you to manage a project rather than harms it. And the first thing you need to understand is that Gantt chart is a tool for visualization of your schedule and your estimates. That's why it's a great tool for reporting and high-level overview for your stakeholders. But for actual schedule management on your project, you should use other metrics. As a project manager, you need to track the planned start and end date for each task versus the actual start date and end date for this task. You see what I mean? You need to track whether you started the task on time and you ended it on time. Because if not, there is a variance between your actual results and the planned values for your project. And within itself, it also controls the duration of the project if it fits between these two dates. So why it's important? Because all the software applications that you will find will allow you to mark the percent done for each task. So you should always be mindful that you are marking the percent done of the duration. But you need to understand that behind, for example, a five days long task, when you are 50% done behind the task, you may have 10 or 20 people doing their work. So the efforts are huge there. That's why you need to control how long it will take for that group of people working on that task to actually finish it in terms of calendar days. Believe me, lots of project managers in the real world fail their projects just because of this very fact. They were tracking the efforts done, but in reality the task is not finished on time. That leads us to one of the key concepts in project management. You as a project manager want to control the project on a higher level. Ideally, you don't want to track each separate task. 
you want to control the progress over a work package or a deliverable. And again, if you don't understand what the deliverable is, what is a work breakdown structure, I'm leaving you a link in the description below. Do check it out after you watch this video. So the first tip was to control your project on a higher level, but the second most important tip here is to ensure that your team always works towards creating tangible deliverables. That's why it's important to build your schedule and gun chart in such a way that you first work on one deliverable, maybe you do a second deliverable in parallel, but you do finish these deliverables first before you start working on another deliverable. So you don't want to schedule random tasks, you want to group all activities and all tasks from one deliverable and sequence them out. From stakeholder management, it allows you to set milestone on your schedule. On a gun chart, you will see a star or any other shape there that marks some important date on your project. And usually it means a date when you deliver some tangible results to your clients to test and try out and provide you some feedback. Setting these milestones allow you to break down your project from the schedule perspective into several sub-projects where you will just track your progress to the one milestone, not the whole project in general. And as you understand, if you meet the nearest milestone, you don't need to worry about the future work. You will switch on that once you reach this milestone. Two more tips. Do add more slack into a gun chart. Don't put all the tasks one after another. In real world, it doesn't happen this way. Especially, you do want to include some slack between switching from one deliverable to another, because this period when you need to provide some tangible results to your clients and then switch to another task usually takes some time. And there is a lot of communication overload during this period because you need to demo the product, you need to collect feedback, you need to adjust your project and so on. That's why you should be very transparent about all the work, all the efforts on the project, including administration and project management, because in the real world they take time and duration from your project from the whole team, not just you. Last but not least, you do want to include the results of your risk management activities right into your schedule, right into your gun chart. It will be just the bars for some resource of time for your deliverables. And it goes without saying that if you don't use this resource of time on your schedule, you will deliver your project faster. But believe me, in most cases it levels up. You will do one deliverable faster, one deliverable will take more time, but in average it will be the same date. Okay, if you like this video so far, do click the like button and I'll give you five seconds here. I'll wait while you do it and we'll proceed. Thanks. You heard me saying that to create a gun chart, you need to start with identifying all the tasks. And it's about scope management. That's why I do recommend that you watch the video on scope management next. And after that, you also need to watch the video on risk management. So just click one of these videos right now and I'll talk to you there. Thanks for watching. See you later.